This is the European edition of Breaking Banks, the world's number one fintech podcast and radio show. We bring you the European unicorn startups, founders, regulators, and leaders innovating the rapidly evolving fintech scene today. A truly localized podcast with both English and local language content with some of the world's most well-known hosts and influencers in the fintech sector globally. Join us every week as we explore what makes the European Union a phenomenal proving ground for many of the fastest growing fintech plays in the world today. Okay, let's roll. Hi, everybody. This is episode number 125 uh, of Breaking Banks Europe. News from the fintech front. Now, episode taking care of April 2022 in particular. And uh, I think this is definitely not like any other April uh, when we look to the geopolitical situation out there. But before we dive into this and how that potentially impacts actually our little fintech world, uh, allow me to welcome my honorable guests of today's show. First of all, a prima, Giada Gambadoro. Um, Hi, everyone. And uh, last but not least, with two guests, Xavier Gomez, uh, actually also on the show today. Thank you very much, both to you, to both of you, actually, for, for joining and, uh, and coming today. Hello, everybody. Thank you. Um, I, I would say um, maybe it's uh, extremely helpful for our audience if, if you, Jada and Xavier, then uh, introduce yourself a bit. What is what is your background? What are you doing? Where are you located? You know, this is a European show, so we are always very keen to know where our guests uh, are located and, you know, what, what, what keeps you going. Sure. So I'm Jada Gambadoro. I'm currently working for PwC Italian Consulting, so I'm covering most of the Italian market, and in particular, I'm responsible for the fintech development in Italy. So what we currently do is to act as a bridge between the fintechs and our financial services clients, so that we can help the first to, to compete in the financial services market, that we you know is often very complex to start in. And we also help our clients to find the best option for partnership that can last. This because in, on the other side, for traditional and big financial um, actors, could be hard sometimes to, uh, to enter in a partnership with a, such a different reality as a startup or a fintech. Jana, Jana, that, that is fantastic. We could do a standalone podcast about the collaboration of fintechs and incumbents out of my perspective, you know, and if you look to me, uh, 50% of my gray hair is exactly resulting out of that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. That, that was also the, the main topic of the last report our observatory released last year. So uh, this year was about collaboration and how it is more and more happening between the different actors right now. I, I think the question whether you think there is a potential for collaboration, asking you that question makes no sense because you want to bridge it. So the answer would be yes, anyhow, right? But what are maybe just as a kind of extended version of that intro, what are the three randomly, what are the three most important um, actually ingredients for a successful cooperation in between a fintech and an incumbent out of your mind? Yeah. Yeah, I would say, first of all, to select a fintech that is in the, in the right state uh, of development. So a lot of timing can happen that uh, financial operators look for fintech with very good ideas, but maybe they're not ready to increase and to scale their level to welcome all the clients that the incumbent has. And we're talking about a lot of clients, like millions, to be managed at once. And the second part will be to understand there is different culture from both sides. So the startups usually need more flexibility and uh, a more proactive approach with respect to a normal provider. And on the other side, startup has to understand that banks and, fin and financial institutions in general, insurance companies, they have their own internal processes. Sometimes they cannot change from this process. So it's a, it's a way to find a space where they can match these needs. That's why also we can see there is a, a rise of a corporate accelerator going on right now to create a safe space that, where they can know each other better and start to cooperate since the beginning 
not waiting for the proof of concept state. And this is very important because for the third part, most of the problems comes from the fact that move a proof of concept to the industrial phase is the very hard part. And so it's important when, we, when there is a relationship between a startups and a financial operator to start to think since the beginning about which are the constraints and the limits to move forward in an industrial phase so that the, the effort and investment don't stop at the proof of concept part, I would say. Okay. And, and, you know, I think one precondition is that the proof of concept phase is not that extensively long, actually, including a procurement discussion that the startup still is alive, right? Yes, exactly. That's what I was saying in terms of different culture. The startups cannot be considered as a, um, an, a usual technical provider. Yeah. So when they enter in competition with other traditional providers, it has different logic. So sometimes the procurement process is the most challenging one, even though we have seen that the financial operators are quite starting to think how to work around that, sometimes uh, considering specific process for the innovation part that um, deliver also procurement process dedicated for different realities such as the startups. Dada, you mentioned that you um, published a, a report on this. Where can we find this? Where can our listeners and followers find that? Yes, it, it, it can be found in the PwC website. Okay. It's called the FinTech Observatory 2022, and it's free to download. So. And if there's somebody who should know about all this, it's PwC. Don't be agree. <laughs> <laughs> Xavier. Sorry for letting you wait, but you know this is exactly you know what what Jada described now is is uh, was. I'm so happy to say that was uh, something like my home turf over the last years when when still being at Feeder. Xavier, introduce yourself. Who are you? What is your background? What are you doing? Hello, everybody. My name is Xavier Gomez. I'm former banker, moved to uh, the dark side of entrepreneurship in the tech. <laughs> um, I 2000, in 2018, I co-founded InVio, um, a data management company used uh, machine learning and natural language processing. Um, uh, I was a, a former banker with top management position in Credit Suisse during uh, many years. And uh, as I mentioned, I decided to, uh, to, um, to the fintech world because I'm consider uh, it's uh, the future of finance. Uh, clearly. And uh, this is the reason why uh, I decided to sharpen my skill on, on this subject uh, to study the fintech in MIT, uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, in 2016. And um, I come back uh, in Europe in order to um, create and co-found my uh, company in the data management dedicated to our financial services. We provide um, uh, data and uh, analytics data uh, for banks, insurance company, uh, consulting firms, um, uh, private equity firms, in particular uh, venture capitalists. And um, yeah, we are in you, we work for digital transformation of uh, all this company via the, the data today. Uh, I, uh, b being a fintech entrepreneur, I, I would say something like emotionally, at least the last 28 years, why is that the dark side? I would see actually the incumbent side to be the dark side. <laughs> finally, so that, uh, Xavier, uh, finally, you come to the light. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yes, because you know, this is every time the same story. I, I know you, you you know very well the, the finance sector uh, in, in Europe. And uh, a lot of people in the industry told me, but uh, Xavier, you are crazy. You are very well paid. Stay on your position and uh, why you take oh, so much risk uh, you you are you, you are this so bad and uh, i say this is my choice i want to to make something before uh, 40 years old and uh, and uh, you you can see the digital transformation coming and uh, um, i want to be a part uh, on, on it and participate and not just uh, um, um, comment that and uh, and i feel I felt it, it was a, a kind of uh, fight um, with a traditional sector 
uh, and uh, this uh, this new sector. But it could be a more a, a competition, you know, and collaboration um, because we we need this transformation. We need a big corporate and uh, and uh, traditional sector, and we need this uh, this new ventures with. Uh, um, fintech solution, tech solution, I- I- in order uh, to check uh, the uh, checking the statu quo. You know, this is my opinion. No, I, I, well, I'm I'm very happy to hear this, and and of course I have a full bias on this. But, but being the moderator, you know, I should have maintained a quite neutral position. I fully understand exactly that you're saying, and I absolutely have a deep respect that you're sacrificing a lot because, uh, as you said, coming from a high paid position. Uh, in a in a very strong incumbent organization, moving over into the uh, as you mentioned it, the, the side of the tech entrepreneur, which means you have to change your lifestyle drastically, right? Uh, from from fixed income per month or fixed salary per month, like to a more balanced sheet uh, enterprise substance driven approach, uh, and that's not easy. I. I fully understand. I fully acknowledge that, and and the culture and style of working is different than in a, a big company, and so on and so forth. So that's a big jump. I've seen many, many people actually um, not making that jump. Yes, intention, yes, but then not really capable to execute it. Uh, so I just can say uh, deepest respect, chapeau, monsieur, um, because um, that's a. From the outside, it maybe looks easy, but it's not, I would say, right? Really, really, you're right. It's not easy, but um, now uh, opening a a large network, Mm. um, because uh, traditional uh, sector, uh, in particular bank insurance, at sea level board member request my opinion, um, because now I'm independent, and I know uh, what it is exactly. Because I put in place a lot of uh, regulation, uh, mm. Basel uh, Three as a treasurer of Credit Suisse in France, uh, Mifi Two when I worked uh, in private banking because uh, I worked in investment banking and after in uh, in wealth management. So I have a larger view, um, and um, now with more or less uh, fintech expertise, I, I see what will be more and less the world of tomorrow with uh, the winner and the loser, the good trend and, and so on. We will talk later of uh, uh, of this uh, new trend in, in, in the payment. And uh, yes, I, I'm comfortable position in terms of strategic view or insurance, uh, bank mom, board member, or even a, a constructing firm I request uh, my opinion. And I linked with uh, some entrepreneur, um, a, a new fintech, or uh, on uh, on on business model. This is v- a very exciting period, clearly. And you know for whom you are working now. Exactly. <laughs> and 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 you know that when you want to do and make something, you can make it happen, and it's not key kind of being blocked by any political instance. Right. Yeah, it's funny because some big company requests to me, yes, we will launch something, we'll be happy to join as a more or less permanent, uh, uh, more or less one per year. I have this kind of uh, more or less proposition uh, mm. to, to join. But uh, yeah, maybe one day or not, I don't know. To be honest. What I, what I do definitely think, Jada, is, is that it's clearly very much needed that we have more uh, actually high-level um, uh, financial uh, professionalism in the fintech environment because sometimes, at least it was my experience when we met some kind of you know fintech colleagues or whatsoever, uh, that the level of, of a professional understanding when it did come to financial topics, regulatory topics, that the level of discussion was sometimes surprisingly low, right? Which is not helpful. Jada, uh, do you, uh, would you reconfirm this or? Yeah, actually, we've seen probably an evolution about this state, at least in Italy, yeah. because, uh, for example, the latest uh, neo bank was founded by navigator bankers, let's say. So what, uh, what I think is that there is an evolution involving more professionals, people by time time, so I think that the level is increased a bit and uh, it will keep on moving forward at this point of view. 
Yeah. So before we before we jump into um, actually our kind of industry topics, uh, I think we first of all have to speak not in detail about the developments what we see here of what we see over here in Eastern Europe uh, by uh, within the Ukraine, but. Uh, I think there are a lot of political commentators out there who do a tremendously great job, so it's not up on us. But I think it's it's nevertheless fair to have a, a short look and on this and say and and identify what kind of impact that delivers to the fintech. Do you think that the Ukraine crisis overall, sooner or later, will also come back as a as a kind of crisis to the fintech development? Also, then adding and spicing the whole scenario up with increasing interest rates uh, and so on. So is that affecting our industry, Xavier? What do you think? Uh, this is, this is um, your question is a challenging question because uh, as you know, in geopolitical stuff, it's uh, not easy to anticipate some, some view. What I'm sure... Um, Xavier, Xavier, sorry, um, I have to share one point and why this is relevant. I, I give you two examples, right? When we when we started, uh, actually we had Fido East Europe started and it was ready to be deployed into the Russian market and that happened just weeks before Mr. Putin invaded the Crimea. So we had to oh, stop yeah. it, yeah? So we had to stop it straight away since then I'm reading the news differently, you know. We did do our trade sale transaction with uh, BPSU in, in 2016. Then Brexit happened, and we had a strong... <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so I think, I think, and, and, and I think it, it... Wouldn't you agree it can affect us? Exactly. The, the, the only thing I'm, I'm sure, um, because now I'm navigating the tech world, uh, uh, I'm, I'm like, uh, I like you as a veteran, Ukrainian p um, talent are very well recognized at very top level guys. Yeah. And at the moment, um, maybe as you know, we are short of more or less one million of uh, tech jobs in Europe. And uh, most of, of, of the job was outsourced in Ukraine before yeah. the war. Yeah. And now it makes more tension, clearly, to uh, salary, uh, to the cost of uh, different mission. And because we don't have enough uh, tech people uh, to make the job in uh, in Western Europe, and uh, it, it's 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 a big challenge, and I hope um, I hope um, Ukraine will come back uh, more or less uh, to the peace, and uh, and and people will go on the the development they just start a few years ago via the the tech because they are very strong on, on that. Absolutely, uh, to, to, to be honest. My, my friends at Solaris Bank have, uh, I think they have a group of people sitting in the Ukraine did, doing developments at TradeLight. We had UX developers in the in the Ukraine. Uh, at TradeLight, we even had uh, potential customers coming up using games as a customer acquisition tool in the Ukraine. So yeah, it, 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 it's so sad to see that this kind of flourishing, uh, finally, finally, little bit flourishing country now finds that reality. Jada, what is your view? How, how is PwC? I know you can't maybe speak for the company, but what is your perspective <laughs> for that? I don't want to cause any no. issues. You know, don't worry. Yeah. No, as Xavier was mentioning, it's currently a very challenging topic to discuss because there's so, so many points of view and concepts, which I would say for sure it has a strong impact. I think also from a social perspective, you know, in terms of reaction, because it's an event unexpected for many of us and for sure that there's um, a huge psychological impact on everyone. I would say that in terms of uh, fintech market, it has more an ambiguous impact so far because it can foster some type of innovation from a certain point of view. I'm thinking about, for example, the cryptocurrencies that were, that were used to finance both the Ukrainian side and the Russian side. So opening again the debate about the ethical use of uh, this type of instruments. So uh, how they can go outside the 
the current market and how can have different effects according to who is using it. But also it can have an impact in terms of relocation of some of the balances and activities that are currently performed. So I'm, I'm thinking, for example, about the Casperi case, that is uh, the software used for cybersecurity that, for example, Italy has a wide use. And then now being that is a Russian software, as a result of this situation, they are starting to thinking about um, we should maybe substitute this tool with other types of uh, uh, providers and technology. So from one side also is opening opportunity to, um, to create new market uh, um, actors that can impact in a different way. Or I'm thinking about also the climate effect related to the discussion about uh, how we can use alternative sources respect to the gas so that is now provided by Russia. So this could foster somehow the ESG topic to the next level. But it is also very early for, in my opinion, to see uh, what will be the actual result of all these impacts, both because there are many of them that are acting together and both because being that it is a very hard uh, situation to read at the moment, it's not so easy to understand which will be the final effects. So of course, we all we hope for a social and human point of view that it will end soon and in the in the best way for Ukraine to recover as much as soon as possible. But this is outside the fintech topic, I would say. Yeah, but but as said and indicated, fintech is not living on its own planet. So I think there okay. uh, there's all good reasons that that we have a look to the geopolitical developments. Uh, and, uh, you know, with that thought, actually, um, I do let you go into a break, guys. Uh, this is episode 125 of Breaking Banks, news from the fintech front, almost literally in April 2022. So enjoy the break and come back when you he want to hear more about actually how the whole situation is potentially impacting on startup funding or uh, how we see that when it comes to buy now, pay later mega trends uh, in this upcoming scenario. Stay tuned. Let's talk about the future of payments. Your Breaking Payments exclusive series is here, and we are ready to showcase how fintech has deconstructed the payments industry and is rebuilding it seamlessly as an embedded experience for the client. Stay tuned for new episodes every month on Breaking Banks Europe. Hi, guys. Back again to episode number 125. We're really getting into the big numbers with our Breaking Banks Europe podcast. Today, we speak with Jada and Xavier about the news from the fintech front in April 2022. And just before we entered into the break, we spoke about um, actually the impact and how we see the geopolitical situation now affecting or not, or even, you know, supporting the fintech development. Just before we enter into kind of any um, more like operational topics in the industry, do we think, uh, Xavier, and, and I look into your direction, what, what do you think is the impact actually on, on, on startups out of the situation we see now, you know, having the Ukraine crisis, the war on the one side, having an increasing interest rate environment? Do you think this will actually bring down valuation? <laughs> and I deliver you the answer in the question. <laughs> what is this doing to KPIs valuation? Will it close or open the pockets and the wallets of investors? What do you think about that? I think it will be more challenging uh, as uh, as you know, because you are veteran of finance. Uh, we already knew this kind of period. And uh, I think it's challenging for the new, new venture uh, project in terms of um, investment, in terms of, uh, in terms of risk. Uh, it's a question of months, I think so, in order to have a clear view. But clearly, the, the rising of interest rate is um, it's, uh, it's a big challenge because you have to make an arbitrage between uh, um, an investment with a big risk, fallout, 
and an investment with uh, you don't have a risk uh, the 10 years um, us 10 years old for example the t not for or the, the bund uh, german bunds uh, you can invest during 10 years and positive side uh, this is a big challenge but i think now most of people understand we are in cycle of innovation and we cannot stop because we we have so much investor money on different area uh, for, for for research development in terms of ai in terms of uh, uh, life science in terms of fintech something will uh, will uh, will move and uh, and uh, i'm pretty confident um, for for the future but it will be more challenging for a new project to, to find fund and for um, some mature project that don't uh, fulfill uh, the, um, the, the, the business plan promised to the investor. Okay. I see. And Xavier, this is a good point. I think, uh, like, let me segue into a very specific sector of our industry, which currently seems to be or is a, you know, the new hot shit, so to say, buy now, pay, pay later. Yeah. BNPL, uh, so to say. Now, once we enter into a scenario of uh, an increasing likelihood of recession, and I was on a conference of APIS partners, an investor into Southeast Asian, Indian, fintechs, and African. Uh, fantastic conference last week in London, and there was the global head of fintech of Goldman Sachs sitting on the panel, right? And he said <coughs> that there is a 35% likelihood of a recession within the next 18 months. Do we really think that buy now, pay later still is the, is the super trend? First of all, second, isn't that, you know, coming from incumbent banking, uh, isn't buy now, pay later something we have called installment payments in the past or what what is that right is that is that facing a, a, an issue you think by by having this environment now um, do we have to reduce growth rates and expectations or do we think this is something like the world savior in your in your example uh, i think maybe it will be challenging for um fintech on this stream uh i would say for um for the new one, but for the the top, this thing, the the, the, the Klarna um, and, and the US player, it will be not a problem. Okay. Because because they they well funded, they have a trend, but now they will create another problem from consumer side. If we are in recession, some people will lose a job and they will money. And they can use this kind of uh, solution for day-to-day -day life. And for me, I'm not comfortable for that because we can create um, a bubble debt, a new bubble debt. Absolutely. That, that, is, that is what exactly I wanted to say now. But yes, it's, it's nice that we have such services and, and maybe we can use, or definitely we should use data analytics and artificial intelligence to support those people and, and to make that a a proper solution to all and everybody, but aren't we creating uh, a debt bubble? And and if if people can't pay back, you know, this is why we in regulation have credit worthiness, uh, credit worthiness, and why why we have to check that people can pay pay back actually. So where 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 we see where we see actually, uh, let me say, uh, traction coming down already is obviously also in April is is uh, brokerage. When we have a look to what um, Robin Hood uh, announced that they lay off people and so on, I find that to be a pretty interesting development. Exactly. In, in fact, the ID, the first ID, is was pretty cool. Democratize. Uh, the access uh, to to the money, but um, and allowing consumer at the point of sales to split the payment in, into smaller, more affordable uh, installment. But this is not really new from my point of view, and uh, again, it could be very dangerous because when you use this kind of uh, solution of payment for uh, day to day consumption. Consum consumption, 
after you have to, to, to have the sufficient money to pay at the end. Mm. And um, this is a reason why I like the client experience given by this solution, but I'm worried about the final using by a final consumer at the end of the day. So would you agree? One once I would say, um, I think actually that uh, I think really I'm, I'm I'm afraid to say multiples might come down on on company on enterprise valuations in particular also the fintech environment. Uh, as you say, I, I fully share your view uh, by saying okay the let me say those with a um, already sustainable uh, uh, significant business line will maybe face a decline. But if you're very new on the block, maybe this is a very tough timing now. Mm -hmm. And and I, I think what we can deliver as a message to all fintechs out there is um, actually kind of get cash in your pockets and, and prepare for a long winter, right? It, 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 exactly. And, uh, you know, today, uh, BNPL reflect more or less Um, more, more or less, sorry, a small portion of uh, of, of the overall uh, spending on payment card, yeah, including credit, debit, prepaid card, with more or less 100 billion in 2021, oh. compared to the about eight trillion US dollar in annual spend volume in yeah. US. So, so this is just more or less the beginning of the trend. Mm -hmm. And again, BNPL get a fierce competition, what I see, um, because uh, you have a white label player which integrate with banks, uh, enabling banks to offer BNPL. Uh, Goldman Sachs just announced, uh, announced uh, its acquisition, uh, I think last year or uh, the beginning of the year of leading provider Greensky, um, credit card issuer such as um, Citibank and uh, Deepo Morgan Chase are defending themselves by upgrading credit card to a low BNPL for certain purchase. Um, startup like Zilch are also playing this card. Um, challenger banks such as Revolut, Monzo, Curve, uh, Luna, are also starting to offer BNPL. Well, the rationale here is not to lose customer to BNPL players. Um, however, the user experience is still playing catch up as noted uh, by different consulting firms. And uh, to find, uh, to, 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 to conclude on, the, on this point, multi-lender networks are being built by Visa and MasterCard Visa built a BNPL API. Um, I think the name is a Visa Installment, um, the name of API, in partnership with Charge After, while MasterCard has acquired Wise, a provider of POS financing solution. So well, you, 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 you see holds a player and solid player because uh, most of, uh, of these players are very well known. They are, they are more interesting, and they apparently greed is good on that. Wonderful, wonderful. Xavier, thank you so much. Uh, you know, Xavier, you did listen to, we, we covered a little bit of the buy now, pay later trend, which obviously came to another peak in April. Jana, you know, every month, same question. Any news on sustainable or green finance, or is it just still kind of business as normal, or business is sorry, business as usual already? Anything you could report out of that for April? Yeah, we have seen that the climate fintech trend is rising again. And um, this is something that we have found out uh, in, the, in the state of climate tech uh, uh, report in 2020 of WC. And what we think, uh, according to this report, is that uh, this trend may be fueled by the greater consumer and uh, corporate demand. So what we are seeing at the There is a good fuel still that is coming directly from the final users of this uh, of these services. They'll keep on to ask for that and uh, keeping the tension high from the corporate as well. Um, one thing that would probably be still needed in order to go further would be uh, to have a supportive policies and regulation 
And this something is happening because, for example, we have more than 100 countries that are committing to net zero emission economies before 2050. So this is a good signal, but probably is, there is still something to do from a regulatory perspective in order to harmonize and provide a, a clear and, and a regulatory environment to work with. We also have seen that investors are keeping on to be very interested in this topic. And for example, we have seen that investors that represent over 45 trillion of asset under management have actually signed to drive action on climate change. So we are expecting uh, in the future to still have uh, a good level of interest and some more concrete action taken from different perspectives. And at the moment, the focus is still on the green part of the ESG, but we keep on saying that the interest should also be focused on the social part and the, and the governance part that are uh, very important. And sometimes from a financial services perspective, probably big uh, financial services operator can have uh, an impact, a real impact, more work on the social and the government si and the governance side than on the environment one. So um, it's, it's still a topic that is hard to exploit, but the, the positive signals are still coming. So we are looking with very interest on it. And Anna would say there is, and then we are back again in the geopolitical situation. Uh, Anna would say that actually Vladimir Putin is one of the big advertisers now for renewable energy, isn't he? Yeah, that's uh, true. Because, because in particular in Italy, I would say, and in Germany, we do see what the dependency on carbon-centric energy sources actually now does to us in that particular situation. Correct. Actually, in Italy also, there was a very big debate around the use of nuclear power, for example, in the past years, in the past, to be fair. And now this debate that was kind of close is starting, of course, to rise again um, as a result of the uh, of, uh, Ukraine and Russia situation. So mm. we also have seen some opening from people that before were thinking about saying no to the nuclear power. So this for sure, will be into discussion again. The topic, as always, the very the point is not to talk about that or to be uh, or to agree about that, but how in concrete this can solve some of the environment issues we are currently living. And to be fair, this is also part of a path that, for example, Italian cities has already taken. I'm thinking about Milan. This is my hometown. Uh, we have seen that the plan for the future of Milan has changed quite a lot. We are move, moving toward a more sustainable and livable town respect to the past. So it is, it's more a matter about to see how we can make a real impact in practical terms. Yeah. So I think since, since the Ukraine war, actually, everybody understands how strategic renewable yes. energy is. It's not even, it's not even, you know, if you don't get it, hey, guys out there, if you don't get it on the ecological topic, get it on the strate strategy topic, you know? Yeah. So uh, I would say that is, that is uh, in particular, in, that's, that's the biggest learning, uh, a very sad reason for, for a, yeah, well, uh, hopefully great learning. Um, in, in the most recent weeks of April. Um, yes. Actually, um, we, we've identified in our preparation, we identified another topic, which is about new crypto regulation in the US. Uh, who, who wants to jump first on this? So if I was in, in, in vacation in April and I didn't read the news, what is important to know about new crypto regulation in the US? Who wants to say something? Jada? Yes, uh, yeah, I would say uh, it's a really actual. He was passing, say. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm right, too polite, which uh, is. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, I would like. say it's relevant here to, to align the, the Biden executive order that was signed at the beginning of March. And uh, we, the order aimed at uh, uh, reinforce the US, the US space in digital asset arena. In particular, um, it's focusing on ensuring adequate protection for consumers as investors, also through the definition of the national policies. This is a very big step because it uh, also um, highlights a proactive approach that the U.S. regulation regulator wants to take, but also that there will be a national framework to refer to. And this is something that provides trust usually to financial operators to move forward in this, uh, in this, uh, in this arena. 
All right. So is there anything particular I should, as if, I, if I'm interested, I should look at? Is, is there uh, any source you would uh, steer people to? Or? I would say official government sources that uh, okay. they release the, the text of the order is is, uh, is quite I mean simple to read. It is not too technical from a, a crypto point of view, and oh. it would be more interesting also to see which which is coming after the order. But for sure, it's a sign of the USA taking a big step in on this part. All right, Jada, thank you so much for for delivering us the insight on this uh, and so, some some spotlight on that development. Actually, looking to the time, uh, we are coming to an end again. It's always as that is when when you have fun, time flies, so to say, as we know. Um, I, I don't want to conclude that session without asking my, uh, I'm frequently asking my guests, is there a kind of final sentence for maybe the month ahead or whatever kind of is up in your mind and you find to be relevant to be shared now? Xavier, what is, what is it that uh, you would love to express at the end of that show? Before uh, to, to give my word, can I just make some some uh, highlights about uh, the executive order or? oh yes please go ahead if there's uh, yes. if there's a super relevant topic I, I forgot about it now um no 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 problem this is my personal op op yeah wonderful no no, no go uh, for it don't worry, don't worry. But, yeah but by signing an executive order on 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 digital assets as the president biden has a signaled an openness of the technology potentially positive impact yeah. And this is a, a significant and encouraging development for uh, an asset class. I mean, digital asset, crypto, cryptocurrency, the, that at the moment they are done trained, but anywhere. Um, if there were ever any fears of a widespread international or United States led crackdown on, on Bitcoin, those appear to be gone. And you, the United States appear to have indicated his intent to be an international leader in the area. That said, it would be naive to suggest the executive order will lead to relaxed legal and regulatory scrutiny. And it's funny because one of my professors uh, when I, I studied in MIT was Gary Gensler. And now Gary Gensler is the chairman of the Security Exchange Commission. It, it, it's funny for me to, 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 to see on this position because he yeah. has to regulate. And w when you know it was the, the professor for Bitcoin and blockchain, <laughs> so, so it's funny. But who knows? We will see. But this is a good point, a, 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 a good a, a good element. UK makes the same thing few few weeks ago, but now in Europe we we wait uh, uh, the regulation with Nika, uh, the final vote in European Parliament, and we will see between UK, US, and the European Union where is the better place to for for crypto. So you think that, that it's it's ending up in a kind of um, competition. Yeah, we can say that. Wonderful. So that is actually, you know, uh, I would say, yeah. Well, co competition is always good for the one who is the customer to to this, and and us as the startups and fintech industry, we are the customer to regulation. So uh, I would say. Who's doing the better and more favorable uh, regulation is definitely um, positive to see. And in the same time, I like what you said. It, it should not mean that there's any kind of free lunch for everybody, right? Uh, and I, by the way, and I would not support that. Nobody's interested, in my opinion, anyhow. But I would not support that because once we are again entering into something totally deregulated, this is not sustainable and this will actually kind of scare everybody on the consumer side away, I would see, I would say, right? Jada, would you agree on this? 
Yeah, I agree. Actually, one of the main points in the MICA when it was uh, close to the approval was that they were entering even more restrictions somehow, that yeah. likely they was withdrawn before the approval. So absolutely, especially when we are talking about something that is not experimental anymore, but needs to be used in the day by day in customer life, it is important, of course, that there are there are the same the same securities that we use with other type of products. Yeah. But I think we are moving the right way. On the other side, it's very important that the regulation doesn't become too strict and uh, actually allowed to have innovation and is open and flexible. That's quite interesting, probably also the approach that the regulator are starting to have toward the technology that is different from the past. So we have seen with them with the sandbox, the regulatory sandbox, for example, that a lot of regulators are starting to uh, directly working with new technology provider in order to understand before the regulation issuing how technology works and how can be found the best balance between the innovation needs and the regulatory one. And I think watching all this development and just looking back into the very distant uh, past, actually, when we at, at FIDO, I think we started cooperating with Bitcoin.de in the year 2012. So this is 10 years ago, right? And 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 don't ask me, no, I did for compliance reasons, I did not invest into Bitcoin those days. Otherwise, I would not do mm-hmm. the podcast potentially. <laughs> um, but, but those days, we always have been afraid that the regulator one day will ban the whole thing and that the story is over. But look at it where we are now, out of the long distance. I would say this is a very encouraging, Xavier, as you said, I'm quoting you, a very encouraging development. Exactly. We will see. Who knows? On va voir, comme uh, vous dire. Um, and, and, and it's good to know that you are friends with the regulators in the US now. So. <laughs> no, 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 no. I didn't say that. We will talk <laughs> off, uh, offline, Sammy. I will call you after that. No, 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 no. <laughs> exactly. exactly. I didn't okay. say that. No, no, no. You said you're a student to him, and, and that's, of course, very impressive. No, thank you so much for, for uh, actually chipping in this point. And uh, apologies that I wanted to end this too early, right? That would have been, we would have missed many, many, uh, this additional very extreme value. Uh, information. Um, so, um, are we? Last word. Yeah, no, but are we? Uh, first of all, I want to ask you now: Are we ready to kind of close the show? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, but then last words actually, Jada. Now I I tried with you, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I would just say one last thing: that probably the fintech sector is still perceived as something that is under development or experimental, I will just want to highlight it's not like that anymore. So mm-hmm. it's, it's a full sector that is more and more consolidated that is actually ready to provide concrete solution even to traditional operators. So probably my lesson is, is something in this direction. It's time to actually actively collaborate with FinTech because it's not something to explore only, but it can mm-hmm. provide a real and concrete use case for banking insurance companies. Mm-hmm. Gada, thank you so much. Um, I, I will take those words with me. I'm sitting on a panel next week in, in Frankfurt, uh, organized by uh, a consultancy firm also, and we speak about that topic as well. I will quote you. Xavier, how, <laughs> how, how about you? Ah, it's very simple. Uh, who dares win? Uh, and with those words... <laughs> we have to conclude for today because it can't be any better. Thank you so much, Jada Gambadoro, for uh, participating in the show. Xavier Gomez for also jumping on the video and call. Uh, thank you so much. That was uh, session number, show number 125 of Breaking Banks Europe. News from the FinTech front of the month, April 2022. Again, thanks to my wonderful guests for that very lively and and, and positive um, conversation and exchange we had today. Stay tuned and jump on the show number 126 just after that. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you for the invite. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Matthias. Thanks for listening to Breaking Banks Europe, a Provoke Media podcast in cooperation with Fintech Stage. Don't forget to tweet us out, shout out, or post to the team at Breaking Banks EU on Twitter. If there's something or someone you'd like to hear on our cast, let us know. See you next week on Breaking Banks Europe.